It's in the middle of the narrative about the sickness and death of Lazarus, brother to Mary and Martha, occupants of Bethany, one of Jesus' favorite places to go, their home, because they were dear friends to him and he loved all of them dearly. Follow along as I read this. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. This is what? It's the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May we hear this passage today in just, just a few minutes we spend together. And oh, leave here with resurrection faith bolstered or with resurrection faith introduced into our lives. Thank you. Be seated. Thank you, Josh and Mary and Clifton for leading us wonderful time of praise. You know, there are many infallible proofs for the historical reliability and accuracy of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead on the third day after he was put to death on a rugged Roman cross outside Jerusalem on a hill called Golgotha, the place of the skull. And we in the times past here have, have marshaled those historical, undeniable, infallible declarations that there is more proof of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave than there, than there is for many things that are simply taken for granted as true in the journey. But when all is said and done, The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave must be received by faith. You can intellectually know the empirical <clears throat> information on it because you see the demons feared it, experienced it, and they're not saved. So I want to take this portion of this narrative this morning and just challenge you to think about six things, all right, real quickly. First of all, look at Mary and Martha as they faced a devastating test of their faith. And secondly, that Mary and Martha make a declaration which, which Mark Batterson in his book Grave Robber calls preventative faith. And third, Martha makes a declaration of resurrection faith. We'll look at the difference. Fourth, Jesus makes a comforting declaration to her in response to that faith declaration. Fifth, Jesus asks a soul-searching question of her and is asked of us today. Finally, Martha's answer is the key to saving faith. Look real quickly. In verses 17 to 20, Mary and Martha faced a devastating test of faith their brother Lazarus has died. If you read the previous verses sometime today, verses 1 through 16, there's some interesting things that are said. First of all, Jesus was a short, relatively short, short walk from where he was in Jerusalem to Bethany when he heard, when he got the news that Lazarus was sick. He could have easily made the trip and gotten there in time while Lazarus was still sick and had not yet died. He says some things to his disciples and they miss it. They, uh, this, this is not unto death, he says. 
Lazarus is asleep. Then finally he said, Lazarus has died. And then he says to them, I'm glad this happened. If you take that out of context, what in the world? Jesus was glad that this friend of his, he was glad Lazarus had died. And he explains why. And so when we, when we break into this portion of the narrative, Mary and Martha are devastated. The man of their household, their brother who was pledged by law, by covenant, and by his love for them to care for them and to care for their household. The head of their household is dead. The loss of one they loved so much was devastating enough, but they, they lost stability. Jesus comes finally. Verse 17, when he came, he, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. We were discussing this last Sunday night in our, in our life group. And, uh, like Trevor Kopecky pointed out this, this Lazarus passage, which triggered in my mind the book by Mark Batterson that I had to go back and read again. Thank you for that prompting, brother. Jerry R Rosecrans told us about the, uh, the belief, a traditional belief among Judaism that, uh, that a person would die and for the three days, first three days was in the tomb, they believed that his spirit somehow hovered over that, that he could, he could somehow be brought back to life uh, by resuscitation or something, that, that life might enter him again. But after three days, after that period, they believed that even the spirit of the soul departed. which I think has something to do with why Jesus was in the tomb the amount of time he was. So he's dead. You might say, if you were a Jew there, he's really dead. So Martha gets news that Jesus is coming. And she runs out to meet him. They're grieving. People have come to their home to grieve with them. They're devastated. They believe Jesus and they know of healings he has performed where he has raised people up from illness and, and withered arms, withered limbs, blindness, demoniac subjection. They knew of these things. They knew of the love that their family had for Jesus and the love Jesus had for their family. So they're devastated. Look at number two here. That Mary and Martha make a declaration of what Batterson calls preventative faith. We see it here in verse 21 where Martha says to Jesus when she, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You could have prevented this. It's, it's at once in the same time a declaration of their, of their confidence in his power to heal and something of a rebuke that you, you got here too late. We feel like that sometimes, don't we, in our, in our journey? If God shows up, it's going to be too late. It's interesting when, when Mary is roused a little later in the passage, verse 32, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It's the same thing Martha said. Both sisters had confidence in the healing power. If you had been here while Lazarus was sick, he would not have died. I know that. Brothers and sisters, we, we would do well to have that kind of confidence. That, that preventative faith, Batterson calls it. Sometimes in a great difficult providence, illness, or loss, relational trauma, we think it's too late. To the credit of Martha and Mary, they did not think, had Jesus gotten there while Lazarus was still breathing, they were convinced Lazarus would still be alive. Oh, brothers and sisters, may God, may God give us that, that kind of faith. Then when we hear bad news, whether it's about us, 
our bodies, our lives, about others we love, their, their bodies, their lives, the sickness that has beset them, whether we hear about others whose, whose lives are falling apart, whose relationships are falling apart, whose marriages are falling apart, whether we hear of others who are, who are suffering great emotional trauma. We as believers, help us, Lord, help us to engage that situation with a preventative faith. We know if, if God, if you show up, it'll be okay. You can overcome this, Lord, with your power. May we be found a praying people. Well, but we believe this, Lord. Yeah, we struggle with unbelief, but we believe this, Lord. Help our unbelief and, and show up and do your thing. Do what we know you can do, what you're capable of. You see, what I think, one of the things we need in the church today is a, is a resurrection, a re recovery of, of praying faith, of speaking faith, talking as believers as if God is powerful enough and more than powerful to handle this, whatever, whatever this is. Then I just want to show you where Martha goes beyond Mary. Look at verse 22. Martha makes a declaration of resurrection faith. This Mark Batterson in his book, Grave Robber, really it's, it's about seven miracles of Jesus recorded in the Gospel of John. He starts out with the miracle of the at the wedding feast in Cana where Jesus turns water into wine after they've run out of wine. And he finishes with this miracle and makes some pretty keen observations, I think, about Jesus' delay. Had he showed up, Batterson says, and healed Lazarus, it would have gone into the catalog of just one more healing from the sick, from, from sickness. And Batterson makes the observation that Jesus let Lazarus die in order to show them the full power in himself. To bring him back from the grave. And Martha says this, verse 22, but even now, see, Master, if, you, if you'd been here, my brother, would, he, would, he wouldn't have died. He'd still be alive if you'd have gotten here on time. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Brothers and sisters, do you know that Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us he, he ever lives in heaven at the right hand of the Father praying for you and me, making intercession for the saints, the Scripture says. Do you have that kind of faith? That whatever, whatever the situation looks like, however bad it may look, I know that even now, if Jesus will intercede for me in this, God will give him the answer. God will do it for him. I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you, she says. Patterson calls that resurrection faith because now she is speaking as one. Now she's going to waffle here, but, but she's just a frail creature of dust like the rest of us. She is speaking as one who believes that Jesus not only heals the sick, he has the power to reverse the ultimate enemy, death. So Jesus responds. Once he, he gives a response to Martha that we do not see him give to Mary because Mary did not go the next step. Mary stopped with the confidence slash accusation that if Jesus had come while Lazarus was still alive, he'd be alive still. And Jesus responds with a very comforting declaration when he says to her in verse 23, your brother will rise again. Martha responds, I, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Now, let's pause a bit here. That is an amazing Declaration. This is not something she learned from her brother tutoring her in the belief system of Judaism. This is something they've learned sitting at Jesus' feet. That a day was coming when there'd be a great gathering up, a great resurrection. When as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, the dead in Christ will rise first. That not all would sleep, that is not all would, uh, not all would, fall, would, would fall into death, but all will be changed. 
she makes this astounding. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. The resurrection is not anchored in a, so much in a, a date, though it will happen on a specific date that is hidden from all of us. It is anchored in a person. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the life giver. When he encounters Pilate, not many, uh, many hours, weeks later, and power says, Pilate says to him, don't you know I have the power to take your life? I, I hold your life in my hands. And Jesus said, any power you have has been derived. It's been given from above. And no one takes my life. I lay it down and I take it up. The resurrection and the life, the life-giving Lord and Savior who can bring people back from the dead and himself comes back from the dead. He says, whoever believes in me Though he die, yet shall he live. And here, here we have this, this, this double meaning now that Jesus is speaking. He's about to show that in a powerful object lesson. But it's also a truth that anyone here who lives for Christ while he lives, anyone here who has committed his or her life to Christ to become a follower of Jesus Christ, though you die in the sense of earth's death. You simply depart. When Paul was talking about death, struggling whether he would rather go on or rather go to heaven, he said, I desire to depart. That was his term. I desire to depart. Death for the believer is departure. It's just, it's leaving the, the plane of the temporal, entering the eternal. Though you die, you shall live. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord for all who die in Christ, all who die trusting in Him. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, that is, we shall not all die. There will be some who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. There will be a transformation, whether, whether that means we come out of the grave to take on an imperishable body, or whether we are living and translated with him and our, our physical body, our temporal body, our, our body which is decaying, Paul says in Corinthians, is, is transformed into an imperishable body. Whoever believes in me Though he die, shall he live. Whoever believes in me, alive, shall never die. And then Jesus presses this, this soul-searching question. Because you know, she's, as we read through the passage, we won't get this far today, but when Jesus says, take me where he is, and he comes to the tomb and says, roll back the stone, she says, Lord, he's been dead four days. He's... There, there'll, be an, there'll be an odor. He's already started decaying. Do you believe this? He asked her. Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you today. You can believe something and waffle. You can believe something and struggle with it, and that doesn't, that doesn't strike out or cancel the belief you have. Some people teach faith almost as like it's a, it's a stoic resolution. Well, I believe and here I am and nothing will change. You know, life has a way of, of buckling you and me at the knees. It doesn't give us warning. It simply comes. Do you believe this, Jesus said? Do you believe today 
that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. See, the stone is rolled away. Behold the empty tomb. Hallelujah. God be praised. He's risen from the grave. The resurrection of Jesus Christ changes everything. And he puts it to her. And I promise you the answer she gives, there's, there's only one place in the Gospels you can parallel it. And it's Simon Peter at Caesarea Philippi when Jesus says, who do the crowds say that I am? And they tell him, well, some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist, come back to life, some say another prophet. But who do you say that I am? See, that's, that's the key. Young people, it's not who your mom and dad say he is. Who do you say he is? Friends, it's not your brother or sister, your mom or... Who do you say he is? Listen to her answer. She said, yes, Lord. She answers, I believe. Yes, Lord, I believe. I believe that you are the Christ, the Christos, the anointed one, the Messiah, the Son of God who is coming in the world. She's not speaking about a future event. She is talking about the great coming of Messiah. You are coming into the world. You're here and you're, you're coming larger and larger and larger. We've been studying Mark and where we are in Mark's gospel right now, the crowds are everywhere. He is coming. He is, he is appearing. He is making himself known and manifest. A great declaration of faith. Brothers and sisters, I submit to you that this is a high and holy day where, where we join the church across the world to say he is risen. He is risen indeed, and we celebrate that. But truly, the reason we gather here every first day of the week, the reason we gather here every Sunday is because we believe that he is risen. He's risen indeed. We gather here to declare that in song and, and pray together about that and, and speak to one another and encourage one another with resurrection faith. And then we leave here and we go into a world that's really getting it wrong these days. <laughs> Up is down. Right is wrong. Black is white and white is black and on and on. And we go into that world. We can go in discouraged. We can go in embittered. Or we can go as the disciples would not many days later go from the empty tomb of Jesus filled with hope. What is it? What's the challenge today? To myself and to you is to live as if you really believe that the tomb of Jesus Christ is still empty. My friend R.F. Gates used to be fond of he was a great encourager. And I'd say, how you doing today, brother? He'd say, well, Sir William, I checked, and the tomb's still empty. Everything's great. The tomb's still empty. Oh, yes, you and I will have preventative faith. We'll manifest that as we pray for our brothers and sisters who are struggling. We want to see God remove the malady, whatever that is. But to impact this world, we'll take resurrection faith. And so I pray today for all the festivities, all the trimmings, all the things you'll do, that beating at the very center of it will be a hope, a confidence, a joy and peace in believing that Jesus is risen from the dead. And because of that, nothing, no person, no providence, nothing can separate us from his love and the great joy that we have in being loved by him and being brought to love him. He's risen. Amen. Amen. Let's pray.